There are a few essential things our bodies need to boost our immune system and stay healthy, especially in a colder season. Me and my family use Z-Stack, Z-Detox, and Z-Flu developed by the great Dr. Zelenko, who has a place in history for his tremendous life's work. With every purchase of Z-Stack or any other of Dr. Zelenko's products, you also support the Zelenko Freedom Foundation in their tireless work to bring back medical truth and freedom to everyone. To save on your Z-Stack order today, use coupon code INSPIRED. Please find the link to order down below. Hey, hey, Inspire Tribe, my fellow freedom lovers, John Nolan here. Thank you so much for tuning in to another Inspired Conversation. Highly anticipated, as always, when we have him on, um, my partner in crime, if you will, on these shows, uh, film uh, filmmaker, researcher, and uh, just a wonderful overall human being, also the creator of your favorite webinar on the internet, A Tale of Two Timelines. Frank Jacob, thank you so much for tuning in again today. John, it's always great to be in a conversation with you. Thanks for having me back. Hey, I couldn't agree more. I love the expansion of consciousness that's always happening. Beautiful co-creation. Frank, we chatted a little bit before we went um, on camera. Uh, there is a lot to talk about and a lot that people need to know right now to make better choices, right? If you have better information, you have better thoughts, you make better choices. We, I think we could put this as the headline for our conversation today. So what are you bringing to the table? Well, you know, I've been uh, going through a lot of uh, different sort of uh, chat rooms and things and noticing a lot of people are kind of going, you know, I think what happens is people get tired um, of pursuing this intense information. And so there's the kind of a kind of a backlash where on, on the one hand, you get people saying, Oh, this is all negative. You know, we don't want to go down this road anymore. The white hats have this. This is a, we got this right. And and it we're and we're seeing evidence out there in a few cases where they are kind of taking step backward. You know, them or they, whoever they are, we know who they are. Um, and so, you know, the the thing is, we have to be careful not to have a false sense of success because you know, those people are not going to stop. They've been at it for, you know, 150 years, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, I have um, an interesting quote from Carl Rove. Much longer than that. Much longer than that, actually. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, much longer than that. But so the thing is, that's the one thing I've been I've been noticing. And on the other hand, of course, because I'm a researcher and I'm preparing all these talks for a tour in southern Germany, um, I, I'm always up or try to keep up on some of the newest, most dangerous, you know, lurking clouds on the horizon. And some of that involves something called machine learning fairness, like under a sort of an innocuous term like that. There's a very nefarious technology being developed right now that's related to AI and search engines and information on the Internet and the future really of the Internet and the future of that particular timeline that we've been talking about. And I don't think enough people really know about that. So I really think it's important to, to talk about some of these things to give people, you know, kind of the information they need to understand what to recognize out there, because, you know, it's going to become more and more difficult moving forward to decipher what is true and what is an AI generated false narrative. Because these are going to be things that we're going to be seeing much, much more out there, like the version, like kind of like the deep fake version of news articles, you know, which, you know, are going to become so realistic that you will not be able to tell the difference between an AI generated information blurb and one generated by a human being. Which is what is coming out um, now. It's heavily pushed starting late last year, early this year. Um, the all the art of the AI writers, right? The writing programs and and like you said, very sophisticated. And I want to say quickly to what you uh, said earlier, it's almost like awakening fatigue, right? It's like people are too much. Let's just sit back. Let's just and I get it, but I also don't get it. And probably because I have this athlete mindset. As an athlete, you are in your mind. You you most of the time you're in winning mode. You have to be if you want to win, right? So that's where you put your mind and and the zone mode, you put it in, you program yourself, of course, for winning. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. But you don't stop working. You don't stop working till you pass that finish line, right? Never stop. And and I think this is these are the, the combinations here. If you want to go from a more um, practical standpoint, 
But I would, I mean, I'll let you start wherever you feel it's best to dive into so we can really decipher and create discernment around these subjects. And also to realize um, the more we know about these technologies, the more we can quit using them, but also detect them and then shift to the organic timeline again, not the artificial information timeline. Right. Well, you need to know what you're up against, right? So I, I wanted to I wanted to show you this quote that people some people may know, but it's it's not, you know, it's been something which has been, well, 20 years, I guess, that it was released. It's a Carl Rove quote. I mean, just just I wanted you to read uh, to read this with me. It says essentially he was asked by a journalist, you know, about um, information and and you know the idea that using information to bring the truth out there. And this is his his response. He said, as to guys like you, he means people in the media or the alt media. You are in what we call reality-based community, which are people who believe the solutions emerge from your judicious study of discernible reality. That's not the way the world really works anymore. We are an empire now, and when we act, we create our own reality. And while you are studying that reality, judiciously as you will, we will act again, creating other new realities, which you can study too. And that's how things will sort out. We're history's actors, and you, all of you, will be left to just study what we do. Okay? I mean, that is their position. Karl Rove sums up pretty much, you know, what the cabal thinks of us. And they, you know, have a certain sense of confidence to believe that they can say those things and get away with those things because their mechanism of operation is one of risk-taking. I think you've, you know, you'd have to say they've put a lot of information out there that you would never really believe that they would, tr you know, dare to put out there. Like it's almost like they're releasing big carrots in front of the, you know, out there for us to, you know, follow around, right? And almost as if to see what they will do, what people will do with that information if they really will become a serious threat. And I remember when, when Tanya and I were doing uh, talks on something called the Chani Project, you know, computer enhanced, you know, uh, information um, between dimensions that was going on in um, in a hadron collider in South Africa um, that we had gotten information about. And there was a guy who was actually in the project whose job it was to take the information that they had gathered from communicating between dimensions. Okay, this is sounding kind of out there right away, but. Essentially, they'd had they tunneled through to another another dimension, and they were making contact with somebody who was doing the same from their end. And they began a dialogue of over twenty thousand questions, and over about ten or twelve years. And the project shut down with Y two K, and they began to try and reopen it with other technology ever since. But the message that came out of that that was very interesting was that the guy who was in charge of the, um, of that project he had the job of drip feeding reality of what they really knew about into certain chat rooms to see what the response was going to be in order to determine can we put out more or should we backstep on this information so that was you know another very interesting knowledge tidbit to realize that these people are um you know they're working on those levels they're working you know interdimensionally as well so we can never let go of you know this stuff that we don't know about just because we don't know about it doesn't mean it's not going on and the only real thing that you know we can really do to counter this, and this is the other thing that I've noticed a lot with people that kind of say the white hats and we got this, is you know as soon as you kind of put the responsibility for this waking up into the hands of a group or something else, you basically you know you, it's not going to work because how's that supposed to work? What plan? Like who's supposed to do what? Right? The only thing that we can have to realize is that every individual alone has the power to wake up and change himself. Like you have to be so tired of being like a slave, right? So tired of being doing the things that you're told to do, which go against your inner grain, your inner you know, compass of what is, what is true for you and what is right for you. And the, and the COVID narrative was the perfect you know, immersion experiment for them to see how many people are going to go along with the program. Because essentially, if, if we decided, you know, there's way many more of us, if we each individually reach that point where we raised our consciousness to say, no, the buck stops here, they would never be able to do it. That's why the change always has to come within ourselves and can never be part of a group. 
And I think one of the nicest quotes I found that sums that up is a Jim Morrison quote, which I put up on the screen, that said, basically, the most important kind of freedom is to be what you really are. You, know, you trade in your reality, your reality for a role. You trade in your sense for an act. You give up your ability to feel, and in exchange, you put on a mask. There can only be there can't be any large scale revolution until there's a personal revolution on an individual level. It's got to happen inside first. Okay, so I think this has got got to be kind of the the background foundation from which we build our our um, you know our our adventure into the because it is an adventure. Let's face it. We live in exciting, crazy times, and our, I think all of our souls were very special to have, you know kind of chosen this time here right now, this timeline. To land on because you know we have to we have to prove that concept you know because it's one thing just talking about it right i mean like we can talk forever there can be the another great you know disclosure of some crazy story like another tartaria or something and i mean i just recently came across some information from russians that that can prove to you with their information that the last 10 12 000 years of history were basically fake that it was all written down in the last 2000 years like less than 2000 years and they can actually show you that right so you, it's like okay there well, then how does you know um like archaics fit in like for example if you're gonna you know you just did something with archaics like there's gonna be so many different little crazy it's interesting, little it's interesting. Just... they're very interesting right but you have to ask yourself what are they really bringing because we're we're really in this point now where if we don't like start getting actionable information and we don't get that sense where we're reaching that point in inner, that inner sovereignty, that, you know, point where we're fed up with, you know, we're, this is the line. Um, I'm not doing this anymore. Then, you know, it'll, there'll be another one. I guarantee you someone else will pop in to the blogosphere. And I, I, and I can also, I mean, I can document how the whole new age movement was populated by and we you know we've talked about some of this stuff, right? I mean, the whole New Age movement was, you could almost say, you know, if it wasn't organic, I mean, to a degree, there's going to be some form of organic New Age, but to a large degree, an organic movement that's dangerous is infiltrated with artificial versions, synthetic versions of that New Age. And so you can see all these different, you know, gurus and authors and information bits coming in to capitalize on that organic movement. Why? Because it's like there's this polarity. It's trying to pull us away from the organic sense of being who we are and we get misled. So we have to be vigilant, again, that word, you know, of when is it just another kind of worldview psyop that was dropped in? Is the person authentic? Are they even aware that they may be a tool for some other sense of bringing information out there, which is, again, distracting us from what is really important right now in the world i mean what do you think about that honestly i couldn't agree more it's like i you know send me the statement i'll sign it because it's exactly you know and what we continually talk about the, the reason why we have these conversations and we're coming from different angles but we're always pointing to the same outcome and the outcome is not replace one party with another party replace a bad leader with a good leader that can be one small tiny fragment of the story sure but the, the ultimate outcome is replace your outer control leader with your inner leader and become your own leader in your life again. Take 100% personal responsibility. End of story. If people could take that statement and, integ and, and integrate it, we wouldn't have to have another conversation, Frank. But absolutely, we understand everybody has a different path. Everybody walks at a different pace and everybody has different levels of perception. So our aim is to show you both the dystopian crap that is out there wanting to put a final solution on this control where it's, you know, where you with your free will make the last decision with your free will before you won't have any free will anymore when you dive into it. The second version is basically the exact opposite where you use your free will to reject that version and ask yourself, why am I here and what would I like more than this? Is it organic? Is it nature? Is it freedom? Is it real human relationships? What do I want for the next generations? That's what drives us. There's no other reason. There's no other reason to do this, right? And today we run the danger 
of of this invasive technology. And just because nobody put a cha- chip in your brain yet doesn't mean it's not invasive. It's highly invasive because it's so sophisticated that it manipulates you on a level that most of the time you don't see and understand. And this is yeah. what, Frank, what Frank mentioned earlier. And Frank, you're bringing um, revelations about some current programs that are out in the public arena that are manipulating people to um, to our attention today. Right. I I want to I want to get into that. I I wanted to add one more point with respect to what you just said, because um, we really have to learn to feel our ourselves. We have to feel who we really are. Um, it's really about learning how you know who we really are like who are you really like how many people ask themselves that question are you really just the guy going to get a job who graduated from college who's trying to work his way up the corporation make as much money as he can have a family you know raise kids you know get divorced when you're 50 and find a young girlfriend or are you the guy who's realizing wait a minute i'm i'm a incarnated soul and I would actually prefer to kind of go fishing with John and Frank in the wilderness and, you know, and just get into some deep, you know, discussions on what it is to be a soul living in the, re- in, in, in the universe and how the universe is in a dynamic relationship with us, a dance toward evolving itself. Uh, and I think, you know, you can't really do that until you become still. And I, you know, one of the things that I um, I, I was going to show you, I can put it up on the screen. I don't know. If the, have you heard of the Hawkins scale? No, I believe I haven't. Uh, you know, I'll put this up. And, you know, I know Hawkins is very protective of his scale, but I put a copyright signature there. So he should be OK with this. But this set, this is an interesting thing. He's an actual scientist who then reverted to kinesiology to develop a scale, which he calls the Hawkins scale. Let me get rid of this here, um, which is kind of summarizing the path that we were just describing and he has this you know we talked remember we talked about bovies and the bovi scale with you know with 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 food oh uh, I've, seen, I've seen i've seen similar versions of this many, right. many times it's what exactly. we use so, in our work yeah right exactly so the, the point is he's got this like dividing line at he calls 200 which he calls courage and it's like um and everything below that are you know people that are like inability to discern truth from falsehood and he's got all these qualifiers like pride, anger, desire, fear, grief, apathy, guilt, shame. And those are feelings, you know, if you have to ask, if you want to get in touch with who you are and what you really are, ask yourself how much of your response and reaction in the universe to what's going on around you qualifies into one of these categories. And then you can kind of see on the scale visually um, you know, where you are, you know, um, and like shame, obviously being one of the lowest one, if you're ashamed of yourself, right? But the first one you kind of cross to get above toward ultimate consciousness, which is at the top here, is courage. And that's an interesting choice because courage, meaning that is the thing we were just talking about, the dividing line. That is your line. Like, that's it right here. It's like, this is the line and I'm not going past here. This is, you're not going to come any closer to my sovereignty. And that takes courage. I mean, it takes courage. I can, I can, I bet you all those people listening that walked into any kind of grocery store, not wearing a mask and, you know, being boldly defiant had to wrestle with that courage to go in and even do that confronted by all those people, the normies on the other side of that line that are threatened by your courageous act. Basically, we're talking about the two two factors that um, inspire all your decisions. And you can say fear or love. Basically, that's it. Out of fear, out of love, and they're completely different, right? Um, But I want to say something to that scale and something to kind of put even more hope than than we do out there is what happens is every time you make a decision that is above that courage line, right? you expand your consciousness. Look at how the cone is, you know, right. you yeah. expand it. But what is happening and what people are not saying, it's not a linear progression. It's what I call exponential consciousness expansion. The more you do it, the more your consciousness expands and the more you integrate it, but not just you, the more you and I and thousands and millions of others do it, the more we project that onto the whole world and they wake up one morning with an expanded consciousness 
because of the field information f- feedback loop, right? So, or information field feedback loop. So we right. are, we're not just improving our own lives, Frank, we're improving the whole experience. Yeah, exactly. And look, and so look at these words, like, for example, you would th- think neutrality, it doesn't seem like it, it's much, right? But what is neutrality? Neutrality is to be able to stand above your emotions with respect to a situation you're reacting to. And it, it takes a lot to get to the point where when you're in a pattern of react action, reaction in the world around you and people affect you in a negative way, for example, neutrality means that when someone hits you with something that would normally pull you back into that reactive pattern behavior of your old self, you actually stop and go, wait a minute, I'm being pulled into that situation. And then you reach kind of this point of like standing above it. Right. And, you know, and then willingness is obviously then your your engagement at that point forward is your choice. You're not a reaction on emotions, but you're actually choosing. You're being proactive. You're willingly deciding to can either continue that dialogue or you're saying, no, what? I'm done with that dialogue. I'm not doing that. Anymore. And I think a lot of people that, um, you know, for example, that have had kind of mini enlightenments that go home to their families. <laughs> And they've kind of like, oh, they get they get pulled back into the family karma, right? They will have this as a challenge, you know, to kind of like there's this book called After the Enlightenment, There's the Laundry by um Cornfield, I think, Jack Cornfield. It's a I can only re- recommend it. But anyway, then you know, acceptance, reason, love, joy, these are all things, and you get up at peace, right? Because then when you stand above all of that, you're peaceful. It doesn't matter what happens, you can still engage in the trenches of war fair if necessary, but you'll be moving with grace and peacefulness that people will feel. And another thing, you know, relative to what you just said is that I think another person kind of that plays into it is said that they actually took it further and they said for every single person that, um, you know, lives and vibrates in the energy of love, um, they actually counterbalance the energy and negativity of 750,000 individuals. And it, it goes up on a scale. So like the more, you come into resonance with who you are and the more you reach these higher states of being, you actually emanate that and trigger others like the hundredth monkey effect or the 750,000th monkey or whatever you want to call it. Like just, there's going to be a critical mass of people. So we have to, we have to know that and believe it. So people that are saying that we're all these people are waking up out there and really there's a lot of waking up going, there's no denying it, you know? And so we don't want to just be, you know, Peter pessimist, Debbie downers, when we say, well, it's not over yet, right? But it isn't over yet. The, fo- the point is there are signs that what we're talking about has actually had an effect. And there have to be signs because it would be absolutely, that would really be depressing if all these conversations that we've had have really had no effect. Are you, so, saying, you, know, are you, you saying 17 conversations did something to the world? Well, you said we talked, we reached 2 million or something people. And I thought about that after you told me that statistic. I'm like, okay, well, what good did it do? Well, you know, let's just, you know, I don't know, pat ourselves on the back or what do you want? All our audience members like that are all together in this like vibe, you know, we can all pat ourselves on the back for participating because we've generated that field into the universe. So we have to know that that stuff is real uh, because, you know, that's kind of like the subtle science that we're being denied. Like, you know, we've talked about a lot of the science that's been denied. In reality, so we know that there is science being denied. That there's this narrative out there that has to do with where they want us to go. That they're trying to keep us down with. Because when we raise our vibration, we cancel them out. So you know. So yes, on the one hand, you know, we have a lot of people waking up. Uh, but on the other hand, it's not going to make them stop and go away. There's going. There's not going to be someone that walks up one day and announces, you know what, Klaus Schwab's not going to come up to the podium and say, oh, you know, John. We're done. You've psyched us out, you know. No, he's not going to do that. Yeah. He's going to keep going. You know, and what I love about those videos we saw at w- World Economic Forum where they confronted with a microphone in the face all the, all the people that did risk, you know, public exposure at that place, which is why you're seeing less and less of the big names go there, is it shows you that if we actually walk up to them and say, wait a minute, you know, this is what's going on. What's uh, What's your comment on that? What is your plan? Like, if you walk up to a politician and say, you know, there's this technology out there, have like artificial intelligence. Have, what is your plan when in the next 20 years, there's going to be 75% of the workforce is going to be obsolete. Do you have a plan for all those people that are not going to have jobs any longer? 
Uh, we should be thinking about that now, not in 20 years when it happens. What's that plan? And if they haven't thought about a plan, then they have no business being in a position of power, making decisions, having been granted temporary position of power to help us govern collectively. That's actually the ideal form of what government's supposed to do. And so these WF videos that show them scurrying is showing you that if we actually confront them, they will run. I mean, it, it'll be uncomfortable. You have to make it uncomfortable for these people to carry their version of reality out there. And then they will not feel comfortable putting it you out there. Because put, you just put their truths in their face. That's all you got to do. That's or, all you got to do. Or the consequence of their previous actions, put them in their face. You don't even have to assume. You don't even have to find anything else. Put the consequences of their previous actions into their to their face. Put them there. And they are fearful. They are scared. They run because they know. They know. And, and what's also interesting, Frank, a lot of people, you know, in, in, the, in the mockingbird media realm that watch the news, they don't pay attention to Davos. They don't pay attention to World Economic Forum. No. Have you checked the numbers on the clips that are circulating on Twitter and everywhere? Have you checked how many million people are watching this? People are paying attention. And I can guarantee you, not one of those now hundreds of millions of people that have watched the clips are sitting there and saying, oh, that's a that's great, Klaus. Come on, I'll, I'll buy a T-shirt. Klaus rules. You know, it's just not happening. There right. are, there's no Klaus Schwab fan club. As a matter of fact, they have to turn off their comment sections on all of their social media profiles. Yeah. They're, they're such do-gooders that nobody, <laughs> nobody seems to see <laughs> the good they do, and they just get a lot of shit in the comments. It's actually quite satisfying to watch. I'll repeat it. Well, it is. But the thing is that, you know, again, we have them in their group and they don't really like, yes, that's absolutely the truth. But a lot of what's going on in their world happens behind closed doors. And unfortunately, the majority of people out there that are not awakened yet, um, you know, I'm getting tired of that word, <laughs> awakened, but, you know, that are that are not switched on. Maybe that's the better word, you know, in terms of like, yes, you know, that you're seeing millions of people that are looking at the stuff saying, you know, wait a minute, we don't really agree with this, right? But until it's like, you know, to the point where your whole government says, we're, what? we're not doing this, you know, it's it's just that fringe group and they're, they're talking amongst themselves. And, uh, you know, there's a couple of things that I, I, I we should talk about here, okay? Like- I gotta that, jump on something, Frank, real quick. You said they're talking behind closed doors. Well, don't we have technology now to see what they're talking about? Oh yeah. Isn't that part of what you're bringing today? <laughs> Oh, yeah. OK. Yeah. Sit up and take notice. You're going to be freaking out when you watch this. OK, well, the first thing we're going to talk about is something called, here, I'll put it up, brain, oops, brain transparency. I'm Nicholas Thompson. I'm the CEO of The Atlantic, and I will be your moderator today. We are going to have an incredible session. Star of the show is Nita Farahani. She is a futurist and legal ethicist at Duke. Oh, and by the way, I mean, I mean, just um, looking at this guy. This bony little guy, I mean, I, that's not somebody that I want to, I would want to be in a survival situation without in the wilderness, that's for sure. She's so smart and so interesting. You're going to learn time. This is how it's going to work. She's so smart and she's so interesting, okay? This is like the language, right? We're going to watch a short video. She's going to come on stage and talk. And then we're going to do a little Q&A, questions from the audience. And that'll be a wrap and you'll leave <laughs> enlightened and excited. So first off, a video. Uh, it's going to make you see the future and understand a wonderful future where we can use brain waves to fight crime, be more productive, and find love. Find love. Can you believe that? Listen to the words. Like, listen to the terminology here. This is something the listeners should always be very, very careful when they're watching these videos. They program language. This is neuro linguistic programming, it's called they, uh, NLP. He also right? talks to the people as if they are children. And that's yes, also as it. if they are 12 year old children. You're in the zone. Even you can't believe how productive you've been. Your memo is finished. Your inbox is under control. And you're feeling sharper than you have in a decade. Sensing your joy, your playlist shifts to your favorite song. Sending chills up your spine as the music begins to play. You glance at the program running in the background on your computer screen and notice a now familiar sight that appears whenever you're overloaded with pleasure your theta brainwave activity decreasing in the temporal regions of your brain. You mentally move the cursor to the left and scroll through your brain data over the past few hours. 
you can see your stress levels rising as the deadline to finish your memo approached, causing a peak in your beta brainwave activity right before an alert popped up, telling you to take a brain break. But what's that unusual change in your brain activity when you're asleep? It started earlier in the month. You send a text message to your doctor with a mental swipe of your cursor. Could you take a quick look at my brain data? Anything to worry about? Your mind starts to wander to the new colleague on your team, whom you know you shouldn't be daydreaming about, given the policy against intra-office romance. But you can't help fantasizing just a little. But then you start to worry that your boss will notice your amorous feelings when she checks your brain activity and shift your attention back to the present. You breathe a sigh of relief when the email she sends you later that day congratulates you on your brain metrics from the past quarter, which have earned you another performance bonus. You head home jamming to the music with your work-issued brain-sensing earbuds still in. When you arrive at work the next day, a somber cloud has fallen over the office. Along with emails. Oh, this is the good part where they came to arrest John Nolan. <laughs> text messages and GPS location data. The government has subpoenaed employees' brainwave data from the past year. They have compelling evidence that one of your coworkers has committed massive wire fraud. He's even got your beard, man. Now they're looking for his co conspirators. You discover they are looking for synchronized brain activity between your coworker and the people he has been working with. While you know you're innocent of any crime, you've been secretly working with him on a new startup venture. Shaking, you remove your earbuds. What do you think? Is it a future you're ready for? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no. Right? <laughs> oh my God, I love it. But, but it doesn't doesn't deter the woman, right? Let's listen to a couple of sentences. Everything in that video that you just saw is based on technology that is already here today. Artificial intelligence has enabled advances in decoding brain activity in ways that we never before thought possible. You've heard a lot about AI over the past few years. Here at Davos, it's been the talk of the hour, but I want to talk about it in a different way. Okay, well, I don't want to. So anyway, I just wanted to play you that because uh, I love how the minions at Davos even said no. no exactly. <laughs> but listen, you know, I mean, the fact, like the the fact is, like she said, this technology already exists, and I remember when I I first came into contact with that kind of information. I think it goes back at least six, six or seven years. And when I told people about it, they thought I was absolutely bonkers. Like that just couldn't exist. There's just no way, right? Well, I mean, the fact is that is where they're going, right? So you know, you have um, you have Yuval Harari, right? He's saying whoever owns the data controls the data, right, and controls the future, not just humanity, but the future of life itself. So this plays hand in hand with where they're going. And this is his formula, right? Be biological knowledge, compute power versus, uh, with data is, you know, aha, uh -huh, right? So, um, and then, you know, they have these sort of sexy slogans directly on on their websites, which say, okay, there's German on there because I was adding this to my one of my German talks, but maybe there's some German people watching. It says, I know that, you know, somewhere everything I do think and dream of is recorded. How could that be, right? Well, we now know that that is the case. So, you know, essentially, this is the technology that they want to move us into. But what you were saying earlier, you know, I sent that off to a friend of mine, my biophysicist friend over in Germany, and he responded with this. <laughs> this is something, this is a, a Polish article. So, you know, I don't have a translation, but the link is down there and you can use Deepl. But basically, the gist of it is, it says, do you have Wi-Fi? Researchers at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh have found a way to observe people through walls. They don't use sophisticated scanners or fancy equipment to do so. All they need is a Wi-Fi signal from a commercially available TP-Link router and artificial intelligence analysis. The quote is, we've developed a neural, deep neural network that maps the phase and amplitude of Wi-Fi signals 
to UV coordinates in 24 human regions. The result of the study show that our model can estimate the pose of many objects with an efficiency comparable to image-based methods using Wi-Fi signals alone as the only input. So um, for those who are still believing that that's all just science fiction, you know, essentially this is the technology that they're developing covertly. And, you know, I mean, wonderful that they always put it under this positive spin that they're doing it to save, you know, lives and to prevent crime, right? Like so they have been doing with the technology that we already have very unsuccessfully. Um, crime has been rising. Organized crime is at its peak. Trafficking is at its peak. Drug smuggling is at its peak. So, yeah, sure. They've used the power of the Internet to create better distribution schemes and to have better communication for these people. So, come on. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so that's, you know, that's what they're doing covertly. And, um, the, you know, so they don't. The thing is, what we have to realize is that they don't really care what we think. <laughs> They don't really care how we react. They're just going to, like Carl Rove's thing said, they're just going to do their next, they're going to do their next act. You know, until we become those actors and we're just studying their actions for the sake of studying them, we're going to be following and not leading or stopping them, right? So um, they're doing these things, uh, you know, with a large, um, what do they say that? How's that in English? Um, what is Forsprung in English? Uh, with a um, well, they got a head start on us. They head got start. a large head start. They've got, they got a head start on us, right? So, and the way that they're, you know, that because they have this head start, they have this unfortunate advantage over us. And so, a lot of the information, and it, it goes. The next step is there's this covert stuff going on. The next step that is going on is is the overt stuff, and that's the stuff I think we really need to show as well today. And that's something called woke. AI and woke AI is under the under the name of machine learning fairness which i mentioned i think at the very beginning this term this term machine learning fairness has to do with a new AI filtering system that they're using at Google with open AI and other programs that they're running to use AI to dominate and control the information flow of the internet of the future. And the way it works is really kind of diabolical, you know, and uh, there's like, uh, I'll, I could play you a little clip here. This is a whistleblower that worked at uh, Google who was interviewed by, um, J uh, by Epic Times. And he kind of summarizes it nicely here. I'll, I'll play this. Google has been programming a woke AI system that can censor the internet. This is according to Zach Voorhees, a former Google employee turned whistleblower. He explains that AI is at the heart of the future internet, determining what content is shown, how facts are weighed, and which voices should be suppressed. What Google is doing, he explains, is limiting the information the AI system is exposed to so that its breadth of information is limited to biased sources. This is programming the system with its own political biases, which can undermine the basic freedoms of online speech. I heard about this censorship regime called Project Dragonfly, and I went to try to find Project Dragonfly, and it turns out that it didn't exist, but what I found instead was the real censorship engine, which was called Machine Learning Fairness. Machine Learning Fairness, yeah. what is that? Machine Learning Fairness is Google's AI that censors its main products, uh, Google Search, Google News, YouTube, and uh, it pretty much classifies all data found on the platform, and then they can know which signals to amplify and which signals to uh, suppress. Well, because a lot of people, if I go on YouTube, I assume they're giving me stuff based on my search history and my interests. You're saying it's not like that. There's there, maybe to an extent, but there's intentional manipulation for political reasons. Look, if you like to go, you know, look at videos that involve baking, you're going to get more stuff about baking. But if you go to like one of these blacklisted terms, uh, they're going to try to not give you more of that content. They'll give you alternative content on the next step algorithm. And uh, that's pretty much how it works. Like everything works great until you get something that is politically sensitive and then uh, they're going to suppress it. And the next time you search for it, 
It may be even harder to find. That's where a lot of journalists are finding. It's like, oh, I used to be able to find it like a month ago, and now it's gone. And that happens all the time is because of this, uh, um, you know, machine learning fairness that they're using that constantly evolves what it is that you can find on the Internet. Yeah. So, you know, this is um, this is what, what we're talking about here is curating the information on the Internet. So the but, program but by AI, not even human beings, it's AI. Well, you know, AI has to be programmed by the people that created the AI. And so what they've done at Google is they've created they've got teams and projects that are essentially programming specific AIs. And the AI, what people need to understand is AI isn't something that automatically absorbs all the information in the world that's out there. I mean, it it you know all AI will ever be is what has been it's been exposed to via some data bank, via some programmer that's put that information into it. Um, and so by curating the information going into the AI, which then becomes assigned to filtering search engine results, what happens is that basically the AI will be biased according to the programming bias, and it'll begin to flag the um, it'll identify only those things, that it's been taught, that it's been curated to see, and it'll tag those things and put them in a data bank. The next step is that when you are on, you know, on Twitter or on any kind of social media platform, uh, and you bring up, um, you know, a subject that's dangerous, or you know, certain individuals that you may be following have been tagged by the AI, there will be warning signs that will pop up that will prevent you from accessing that information or it'll divert you all together like for example i got you know this message here when somebody sent me something on facebook recently on a private chat they sent me an email literally his messenger is kind of an email and it was a link to something i should really go check out i clicked on it and that's the message i got you won't be able to go to this link from facebook the link you tried to go to does not follow our community standards you know what we call this this is your, this is a CCP firewall, a Chinese Communist Party firewall. Right. This this is exactly what it is, right? So the way it works is then AI then the next step is it goes through the web and it begins to flag things on all of Google's platforms. And the uh machine learning fairness just to you know as information is relative to all of Google's properties. This doesn't apply and, um, to and other Frank it includes everyone that uses AdSense which is Google's uh, advertising um, software and and yeah. almost every corporation, influencer, content creators, they all use it and it's in their guidelines that this would apply to that as well. So here you, you will have your own content removed, but there's another aspect to this, Frank, that I wanted to share with you that I've observed in the last years. All these terms that we use in the conspiracy arena, freedom, truth arena, there are terms that people have become familiar with and if you search for those terms, you used to find information on the particular conspiracy, right? That was going on. Now they, now what they've, instead of uh, disputing it or calling everyone a conspiracy theorists, they're just creating popular entertainment uh, media that carry the same name. They create computer games, they create TV shows, they create uh, bands and songs and whatnot. So the internet is flooded. And rather than when you search for Club of Rome, rather than finding the uh, accurate information about a nefarious secret society, you find video games and you find everything else that they've put under this name. So future generations can find accurate information yes. on, on the original term and what it stood for. Well, you hit the head, the nail on the head there. This is exactly how this works, right? They use these uh, not only just flags to tag everything, the AI is tagging everything, but it begins to um, rank things by order of highest authority. And so it's assigning a, a value called the highest authority val authoritative value to particular forms of information. And it feeds that. And, and of course, the, the highest level of authority, you know, guess what it is? BBC, The Guardian, The New York Times. So when you're searching anything, on the internet, it's always those sources of dissemination that rise to the very top of the lists because it's been biased, because they are considered by AI to be the most authoritative voices on any subject out there.
And right. I encourage you all after this interview, go to Google, google.com, dare to go there. I don't go there, but type in do men menstruate and see what the answer is. That's the most authoritative uh, source <laughs> of information. You'll have your mind blown and you yeah. will learn something that defies biology 100%, defies all of your experience, all of your right. knowledge. But that's well, what happens next is that, that you're, you know, this, like what you're saying there, okay, this then gets the next step. The next step is they begin to feed this information into what is considered the most authoritative database of information. That is, a lot of people are using it, something we all know. It's called Wikipedia. And what happens is people out of convenience, you know, how many of us are guilty, will fly over to Wikipedia to get some quick blurb of information about a particular topic. And so what happens is that Wikipedia becomes stacked with, with information that only fits in within the criteria that's been considered authoritative by the AI. So it'll go to the point where um, you, if you even try to curate a, uh, um, Wikipedia's pages, even as somebody who's a member, you can't go in and add any references that are not considered authoritative references. And guess what? All of them are mainstream sources. You can't put any conspiratorial alternative media links to any information on any uh, Wikipedia website, web page right now, right? So what it's, what's happening is it's they're redefining reality for us using their algorithms, which on the one hand provide search results. And as you heard the gentleman talk about how they, on the next up algorithms, they'll, you know, they'll divert you. If you do a search for baking or cats, everyone loves that, you get tons of next ups in the same but if you do something about 911 the towers went down because of a conspiracy what happens it not only gives you nothing on the on the results on the next up but you start getting like you say game shows or bands that call themselves that or whatever they'll even create fake versions of artificial reality auto, you know software versions of, of of things that happened in the real world simulations and things like that just to kind of divert your attention um, so the AI has become a product of the data, and it means that means the AI is a kind of mind slave. I mean, look at um, the other point that's important here is that this technology, like Open AI, which is being given to us freely from Google, we can all go there. In fact, I, I'll go there in a second and show you some of that. But if you look at, if you go there and you realize Open AI is this, you know, amazing technology which allows you to search information relative to a subject matter that's based on you know the use of ai's power like let me give you an example like say um you are you want to study um you know the history of i don't know the 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 the, the robes worn by all the monks in all of history of the church the roman catholic church from the very first roman catholic church to today well what do the monks wear right that kind of sounds kind of dumb but that's a pretty good example to use ai for because if somebody put all the pages of all the information of the roman catholic church in terms of what the monks have worn over all of time into the ai database and ai has scoured that database you as a mortal would never be able to go through millions and millions of pages to find all the information you want but guess what ai can ai will go Boom. And you'll have all the information filtered for you, pre-curated by AI, and you can get right to work on your research. And bam, it's so powerful, right? That's how AI could really be working with us. And if we all had access to unlimited information and our own, we could create our own search engines using open AI, we would be able to do amazing things as far as getting the truth out. But what happens? Well, put it two and two together, right? The people that are actually accessing real information, like powerful information, um, they are actually, there's one website, I think, let's see if I have that here. They actually got uh, in trouble because they, some wealthy people came up with the idea to begin scanning books and, uh, and put them into a database and they were seized by the FBI. Okay, I don't have it here right now, but essentially the FBI it was an open, it was the largest repository of scanned books on the planet. Okay. Perfect resource for you to go in if you want to study, I don't know, Cathars or Kazarian Mafia or something like that, right? You Such can, a thing does not exist. Right. Something that doesn't exist, right? So 
you would be able to use the AI to, and this company did that, but the FBI seized them and began to go around and try to shut down any kind of redundancies of their website. Just like, you know, we have all these um, Pirate Bay and stuff like that, that, you know, like for films and other things, right? They were like that, you know, but essentially if they managed to shut all that down, um, then all that's left for us is to be able to access what they have granted us access to in terms of libraries. So what we're looking at here, John, in real time, right before our eyes while we were sleeping, is the create this is this is called book burning, digital book burning. Okay. This is the modern equivalent of them burning books. And if they delete and get rid of all those repositories of valuable books out there that have been scanned. They're basically, it's going to be gone forever, you know, unless you have the physical book in your hand. And this is why one of the messages today is for those people out there that have little libraries and books, never let go. Those books are going to be so valuable. That's going to be like the baseball cards of the future. I want to say something to Frank, because we are, our audiences, uh, our audiences, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, um, I want to say mature audience, right? It's 35, 40 years up. So they have living memory of different information sources and the internet is just one of them now it's of course it's become more dominant but it's still just one of them the problem is the generation that has yet it's grown up now um and is growing up now their only source of information is their tiktok feed is their um, snapchat feed and is the internet but but even limited spaces on the internet right it's basically social media so they don't when I talk, when, when you talk to a, a, someone like that, 16, 17 year old, and you tell them something that defies their current understanding, they will go to one of those places and look for it, right? They won't go to a library. They won't go and talk to their grandparents. They won't go and try to piece the puzzle together. They look for a one minute video that tells them the narrative and they will believe it because they are used to their authoritarian figures are influencers that have huge numbers and are popular and get a gazillion clicks on a stupid video. That's where they get their information from. Exactly. And, this is and what's dangerous. Really the problem that we're fighting is that these people that are go to the World Economic Forum, they're really not speaking to the boomers. They're really not. They don't care. They're speaking to the young generation because they know they have no other reference anymore. And they know this, the, this younger generation Unless there are critical thinkers among them, which there are, they will completely jump on board with it because they that's the only reality they see. Right. Well, you're touching on that. That's another main aspect is that it's the, the way they achieve it is through convenience, right? Because the next step in the process is going to be if your website has certification, just like, you know, SSL certification a few years ago, you wouldn't have at a certain point, if you didn't have SSL certification, you couldn't operate a website. And or your website would come up with warnings saying this is a dangerous website or it's a potential, you know, crime scene or whatever. So you would not go to the website. The next level of that is going to be if you're certified with clean information that's been considered classified as an authoritative source of information, you can operate your website. And if not, then you will be tagged, you know, by the AI and your website will never come up in the search results. You will have no success unless somebody knows the, exa the exact URL that you're located or the information is located on. They're not going to find the information. It'll be blacklisted for good. So, you know, the other thing is they infiltrate. We talked about this is, a, this is a battle for your mind. This is a battle for your brain and for information. So they begin to use terms that we have known that we, those of us who are the older generation we learn the real meaning of certain words like, uh, you know, a republic, for example. Let me give you an example. The Republic State of America. The America was formed as a republic. What do we hear in, the, in this day and age about America? America is what? A it's democracy. A democracy. It's a democracy. A democracy, right? Absolutely. And, and right? you and I, we are dangerous to the yes. democracy. And if you were one of those newbie young persons that didn't go talk to your grandfather or didn't have a hard copy of, of a book that, you know, talked about the four founding fathers and or the letters of the founding fathers and the ideologies of what why America, what America was really founded on, you will never know. So I, I check out this video I found. This is a FBI agent. His name is Dan Smoot from 50 years ago talking about what a democracy is. Are you into this? Hit it. 
a constitutional republic, not a democracy. The ideal of a democracy is universal equality. The ideal of a constitutional republic is individual liberty. A democracy always degenerates into dictatorship, which promises government guaranteed equality and security, but it delivers nothing but poverty and serfdom for the people it robs and rules. America was founded as a constitutional republic to safeguard the liberties of the people against the tyranny of democracy or of one-man dictatorship. In this century, great strides have been made toward the goal of subverting our republic into a democracy. The foremost tactic of the subverters is subversion of language. By calling America a democracy until people thoughtlessly accept and use the term, the totalitarians have obscured the real meaning of our principles of government. There you have it. 50 years ago. Couldn't be more current than what we were just talking about, right? Usurping the language, even the idea of sex, right? You just mentioned it. I mean, you can't even own your sex any longer because sex now is what? You can't, like, you know, are, it, it's so confusing for people that the young generation is growing up not knowing what sex they are. They don't know it anymore because these terms have been repossessed. They've repossessed those terms and they've redefined them and they've given them their new spin. And that spin is always left-leaning liberalism, leaning toward this actual, so the next step is absolute socialism. We're talking communism that's being creeping Bolshevism in our society, right? Let me give you an example of how Bolshevism, any young people out there listening, socialism, how it works. Like say, there was this study that I read about a teacher uh, said, you know, talked about co uh, socialism and the students were all pro-socialism. And she says, well, let me explain to you how socialism works. From now on, any tests that our students take, those people that, you know, we're going to average the marks together. So the whole class is going to have the same mark, right? So the first test that went through the two students that were the smartest got an A, you know, got A's and the students on the F's. So it balanced out to a B. So those students who studied really hard and really tried to get the highest marks were disappointed because what happened is that they didn't get the high marks. Their marks were diluted by those who didn't study at all. And they got those people got pulled up and got and passed. Right. So what happened? The second test happened. And those people that studied hard and to get a big note, high note for the first test, they said, well, screw this. I'm not going to study and have other people get my marks. So the class, the level went down to an F in the second test. By the third test. Nobody was studying anything any longer, and the, she couldn't even pass the class. The class basically collectively failed. Which is perfect for socialism, perfect for communism. You don't really want that much education and intelligence anyways. Right, exactly. And that so this is how it works. It's like by reducing it to the lowest common denominator. So, and this applies, why am I saying this? Because of the terminologies that were being given out there, it's changing um, it's changing reality. It's changing the actual definition of words so that the people out there who know what republic is and the people that don't know what a republic is, those will eventually, the numbers will go higher for those who don't know. And the, and the knowledge, if it's not put into a repository and saved and, and searchable and preserved for all time, for future generations, a thousand years, if we make it that far from now, if they try to go back and actually mine into the cultural and knowledge base of humanity in 2023 moving forward, they will have very limited bandwidth to get information from. They, there will be so much information and richness about our culture and our society that will have been lost, right? And, so, And the reason, and I will say this again, I've said this in our conversations, I, I, don't, I don't pretend to be an expert on blockchain, but I understand enough of it that I see the pattern here. The blockchain technology has, as always, a positive and a very negative side to it. The thing is that once information is uploaded into the blockchain, it takes tremendous computing power to, to change it. That's the whole point. That's why it's used for cryptocurrency, right? But the point is what they want to do now is distort reality to the point where they have a picture they like. Then they put everything in a blockchain and you and I won't have the computing power to change that information in the blockchain anymore. And so all that's in there is ev all everybody knows, and that's it because everything is digital. This is why we're saying this is such a nefarious a time period we're in, and those timelines are still quite parallel, but soon they will split. And you just you will have to make a choice where you're on because that 
our AI timeline is is taken off into this, um, you know, it will be a do or die reality. You either go with the program or or the program will terminate you. AI will deem you a, a threat to its existence and to everyone else. And so it will, it will just terminate you. That's right. how it will, it will terminate you. That's it. That's exactly, that is, that's in a nutshell where they're leading us. And, you know, if you look at um, the next, the, the other thing, the final thing I wanted to show you today is something, because what we just talked about with machine learning fairness, um, and you got to, you got to laugh at these names, right? Fairness, like that's really fair, right? Okay. But anyway, the other thing, and that's only pertain, the machine learning fairness only pertains to Google and Google's properties like YouTube and the you know the AdSense and these things you're talking about, but there's something else that they're programming, and that's called um, Operation Jigsaw, right? And uh, and they're putting it under the auspice of hold on, let me get this up there. You know, working to end disinformation, applying evidence, of course, what evidence? The evidence that they've curated, ethics. What are those? Of course, the definitions of you know, for example, sexuality. And human rights, right? Well, who is a human, right? And and then, you know, to make it a safer internet means a safer world, right? So that this is always the buzzwords that they have around it. And essentially, you know, what this is a quote from uh, one of the uh, open eye, uh, from the open eye website. We're exploring a range of approaches, including how to inoculate people against misinformation by building core information literacy competencies, including white supremacy, violent mis misogyny and conspiracy theories, okay? So here we go. You know, they're labeling it, of course. They're labeling us. We are really the danger. The guy that they were, you know, hauling off in that video I showed you before, I wasn't kidding, that really would be you or me or anybody who is in the office. If we were even in an office, probably we would never be caught dead in an office situation anyway. But let's just say, hypothetically, you were the awakened person, the, the, the uh, you know, crystal clear conscious person in your office, and you were kind of transitioning away from being in an office and moving toward, you know, being a free individual person out there. Well, the next thing is this concept of what they call Operation Jigsaw. And this goes outside of the Google properties. This is an AI they're programming, which will go out over the entire web, all over the world. And the way it works is through these four levels, accuracy prompts, redirect methods, authorship, feedback, and pre-bunking. So I'll show you real quick what these do. This is the process of how it'll work, right? The first thing that'll happen is you'll be as an individual scrolling through their your social feed and you'll come across information which is what they deem potential misinformation. So then you'll get this accuracy prompt, like I was showing you with the, the messenger thing I got. Then you'll get you know some kind of bite-sized explanation on why they are seeing the reminder um, um, on why they are seeing the reminder is served to the individual and th their attention is shifted to the accuracy of the content with information literacy tips. Right. So then you're it puts doubt in your mind. Right. It makes you feel like, OK, this could be potentially dangerous. Right. You're looking over your shoulder if anybody else in the office is seeing you on that website, for example. Right. The next step, the individual is now prompted to be more aware and may think twice. OK, so this is the training. So you've been in, you've been in, inoculated like they called it. You've been inoculated with the idea that you're doing something wrong and that the information you're looking for is dangerous. The next step, the redirect, right? The individual completes an online search using keywords that indicate an interest in extremist propaganda. Okay, what is extremist propaganda? Well, it used to be something like 911, right? But nowadays, anybody who thinks about maybe just, you know, raising a family off the grid is an extremist. <laughs> yeah, type in the word patriot into your search machine, into Google, right. and see what happens. Right. And then the redirect method is initiated and it picks up on the keyword to prompt an intervention. So then an ad is presented to the individual featuring more information on their topic of interest. Upon clicking the ad, the individual is redirected to the content that counters false extreme, extremist narratives, which of course they've deemed to be those, right? The next step is the authorship feedback. The individual writes a comment that is identified as toxic. So you've written something on some social platform that the AI they've programmed with Jigsaw uh, immediately identifies as potentially toxic, which they you know is rude, disrespectful, unreasonable, and likely to make someone leave a discussion. You know you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings now, right? Could man, man, you could 
you know, really get under their skin, right? Pers so the next step, perspective API picks up on the toxic comment and using machine learning models to identify abusive language. Then the authorship feedback message is shown, alerting the individual that their comments been identified as risky, offensive. And then the final thing is the individual is encouraged to adjust the language. This is before they've even published the comment, okay? This is not... The before, thought crime was not, identified. They have identified the potential, thought, the potential thought crime has been identified. You haven't even hit enter to put it up on Facebook or Twitter yet, and you've already had four or five levels of interchange with the API. The final thing they call pre-bunking. A pre-bunking video is served to a group of users as an ad in their social media feed. Through short video messages, the individual is informed of possible attempts to manipulate them online. The individual is shown a relevant example of a manipulative technique or narrative and then given counter arguments to refute the claim by their fact checkers, of course. And by analyzing how well video viewers recall the techniques in a short survey relative to a control group, we can assess their likelihood to resist manipulative content in the future. Okay. So this is the you know Operation Jigsaw, and this is note how to they editor. note to editor put a big barf emoji right here, right here, please. <laughs> yeah. Shit. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've seen it. I've experienced it. I've experienced the test versions of it. I've experienced the whole shit. I see through it, right? I see exactly through it. But but right. I will say this: we're not immune to this censorship um, uh, attempt here. We're not immune because we find ourselves uh, questioning, should we post this here? Is this a, the right platform or should we rather put it there? Even this is already a, a form of self-censorship that they yes. have achieved with their tactics. The fact that we're using language today on this show that we know is going to help bypass any algorithms that will keep this video on YouTube where we're probably going to get the most views is a form of censorship, right? I'd love to show censorship. self censorship, I, right? I mean, there's a bunch of things that I could show you right now that I know absolutely we will be. Bzzzed. Yeah, imagine this we could say three words in a particular consecutive order, and boom, the video is gone forever. And and that that's the reality we find ourselves in. But, Frank, now that we looked at this today, I, I want I have two questions for you one is an invitation, and one is a question. Number one. We talked about one timeline today. That's the artificial timeline because we only see in the in the mainstream, the Mockingbird media, it only covers it favorable. It never shows because we used to have privacy concern discussions. We used to have ethical concern discussions. We don't have those anymore in the public realm. So this is the agenda that you and I have is simply show. Look at this. They're not showing you this, but this is what it's really doing. Will you come on next time for our 18th conversation? And let's, for one conversation, really, really, really point out all the beautiful highlights on the other timeline. And let's, for one conversation, really focus on our great progress on the positive timeline. Will you I'll do give, that? I will absolutely do that. In fact, I'll give you a teaser right now of something really, really magical. Good. That is, that is proof just so we don't leave on a bad note that we just got the Debbie Downer news of the Peter Pessimist version of reality, okay? We have to always remember that, you know, that we are, are, we are spirits and we're inhabiting this version of reality, what we call reality, in order to le learn to navigate it and to grow as a soul, as a spirit, and to reach a higher and higher level of consciousness because everyone knows that the feeling and resonance of love you know, that overused and badly twisted L-O-V-E, let's call it light oscillating vibrational energy, I like that better, um, is, it brings a much richer and more powerful and, um, you know, satisfying experience to us here, even in the dense version of reality, even though we know there's other finer levels of reality, and that the universe, we, we should always remember that, you know, as agents of the universe, which you could also call us, embodiments of the like we you know all the particles that are in our system have been through the whole universe we are literally stardust all of us we are literally star children <laughs> and you know so we are the universe literally we are the universe and our consciousness whether you believe it's an accident that we're here 
or whether you believe it was created, our consciousness is getting finer and finer and higher and higher. But for me, as somebody who believes that the universe is something that was created, I look for evidence that it was created to substantiate and to empower those people who hear the messages on the films and information that I'm, the presentations that I'm able to put out there, webinars or talks or whatever, that will you know give them also the, the feeling of joy and spark them to search and to elevate themselves as well and to remind themselves of how special the universe is. And one of those things, I can put it up here on the screen, I think it's really kind of cool. It's something which you can all do at home. It's a test. You can do this. Just choose any random number sequence, okay? Any random. It doesn't have to be four numbers. It can be 10 numbers. But just say, I just chose these four here. I'll give the, the example on screen. 4,573. Reverse that number. So 4573 becomes 3754. Subtract the lower number from the higher number and reduce it to its digital root. In this case, the numbers subtract to 819. The digital root is acquired by taking the numbers and adding them together again. So you keep adding until you end up with one number. So eight plus one is nine. Nine plus nine is 18. Again, you're with eight and one. So you add those together, you come up with a digital root of nine. It doesn't matter what number you pick, John. Um, it'll always reduce to nine, always. Are you, you kidding me? So if that isn't to you, if that if that isn't to the audience who's listening, uh, evidence of the magic of our universe. You know, the only exception is if you take a binary number like two zero zero two or something, and you know, it's two zeros, it, it cancels out. It's zero. Every other combination will reduce. Every other of these multiple com take any number combination in the world that you want, it'll reduce to nine. Absolutely amazing. I've never heard of that. I've seen other uh, amazing number phenomenon, right? Um, that basically pick one number and, you know, I'll lead you exactly to the same outcome. I think it's, I think the magic shows, but um, also, and, and this is something I want to make clear is people that are in tune with what we talked about earlier, people that are above that courage line in the cone, um, they tend to feel even though they don't know the information we presented, jigsaw and the other stuff, they, they feel it. They can feel it. They, you know, they bypass it and they, they make different choices. And this is the most positive thing of it all. That's why we say you got to go inward. You got to sync up with that beautiful energy of who you truly are and who the creator is and have that connection because you will feel the crap. You will feel everything that's not in sync with it and you will be able to move beyond it. And this is really the, the, the beautiful message. And it's also part of the message that you bring out in your, as I mentioned in the, in the beginning, in your hit webinar, man. I mean, just amazing how many thousands of people have watched it, benefited greatly from it. And they keep, see that they watch it and it's a long webinar and they come back to our platforms and just share how valuable it has been to them. So a tale of two timelines, give us a quick overview. What will people get there? Well, thanks for bringing that up. And I just, you know, it's the thing that makes it, um, it becomes more obvious as time goes on is that the, even though it, the, the prompt for making that webinar was the um, Looking Glass project, which was triggered by this Guardians of the Looking Glass video series that emerged last year. Um, I went into knowing, you know, how, it, how um, tenuous and, uncertain things are on the universe and in, in the on the internet on the web and on the information sphere the subject is really a subject that goes into so much more than just looking glass it goes into this idea of the timelines and the the thing that's really magical that's emerged from it is that it talks about these really these two timelines and I, you know again i know there's everyone has their individual timeline but when i say two timelines i'm reducing it down to really the organic version of a timeline meaning the magic inv individual power quantum evolutionary leap that humanity is standing before which will unlock certain abilities that we have that we see in anomalous people out there esp kinetic psychokinetics and mind you know uh, telepathy and things like that um this will begin being normal this is part of a timeline that includes you know new forms of energy uh getting away from things that are polluting our planet and moving toward things that are living in harmony with our planet, 
and you know getting more in terms of local connection to people that's the one timeline and the other timeline is this dystopic unfortunately it is dystopic because all of it is centered around materialism and so these are the these are the two conflicting or the two this is the battle of the timelines if you will between materialist and creationist or we even talked about heliocentric and geocentric so in the webinar it goes into the science behind not just what uh, you know looking glass is and the information about its entire history and it talks about really cool things that were you know that were released decades ago which only now have relevance and it's tied into other forms of information which are almost one to one matched up with it and it talks about history it talks about cataclysm science to try and back up the idea of is there some kind of cataclysm coming or is that just some channeled information channeled information no it backs it up with real you know information that was put there by real scientists not the scientists that were bought and paid for and puts it all together in a kind of condensed version of this is what we're looking at and this is the way out so it gives you also shows you what the cosmos is what's happening in the cosmos right now that relates to our consciousness and how knowing that information can actually fill us with confidence and give us the you know the feeling that we're not alone in this that we actually are part of a journey and that the universe wants to succeed and that there are even though there are these loops and we can look at a lemuria atlantis and you know these destructive cycles or like you know jason talks about in archaics these loops like time loops right well the thing is we don't have to repeat those time loops that's the message that comes out and and there's a way to do that and that's what the webinar sort of gets into. I love that, Frank. And I encourage you all um, to go and watch the webinar. It's an amazing, you can you can split it up in three parts so you can watch the whole thing, binge watch it. Uh, the beautiful thing, it's also very easy on the eyes because Frank happens to be a brilliant filmmaker. So he makes it look beautiful, which is so much easier to perceive and, and, and comprehend information also. And the beautiful thing is, see Frank, he he keeps, he, he's, uh, he's on, on some podcast, almost every day of the week. Um, he's out there beating the drum on speaking tours and whatnot. And by you going and watching that webinar, you will greatly enhance your own experience, but you will also support his work and uh, make sure that he can continue to spread the message. So go, uh, the link's in the description, watch the webinar, share it with someone, and, and let's put the message out because he so clearly puts it out there. And I think it's absolutely important and beautiful that people see this. And also, in addition to that, right, um, if you really want to binge watch on something, we got about 17 conversations now that are in a playlist <laughs> here uh, of our interviews, and, and you can watch it. It's going to be one hell of a journey, and it's nowhere near from being over. We're just getting started, Frank. Yeah, man, I get so many people writing me. I got to say that that have just they say they really literally they got into I mean, amazing people like musicians and, you know, I, I even like really I can't even mention all of the people, but they just say that they have they discovered it and then they got sucked into this vortex of binge watching our videos. And I, that's such an honor. OK, for me. Right. That's first and foremost. It's an honor for me that people would even say that which means that the quality of interchange that we're having is obviously triggering something. It's obviously representative of um, a need for people to be having these conversations. So we are the surrogates holding these conversations for maybe a larger group of people. So, you know, that is like, for, that's why it's such an honor to be having these conversations. And, and, and by the way, you know, if you do, like John said, I'm going to be, I do live talks, I do live presentations, which are another thing altogether. And one of them is going to be at Conscious Life Expo in Los Angeles on between February 12th and um, 14th or something, or 10th and 12th, 10th and 13th. I always get this wrong. So if you want to look me up there, maybe, John, you could put a link down. Another way to kind of, you know, sponsor or support me is to, if you want to go there and you want to get something there or buy a ticket, Use that link because then it'll help me fund because I'm, I'm flying over on my own dime and I do these things on my own dime. Like you said, I don't ask for money for shows. I don't ask for anything. I Everything I do that I actually create, yeah, I do ask for money for it. But that is the only way that I can 
avoid the office job so I can be out here on the cutting edge and on the front lines and put this information out there without any filter, without any bias, just as an honest Frank telling you the way it is, the way I see it, without any censor. And if I'm wrong about something, feel free to correct me. I'm more than happy to put that corrected version out there because we don't want to, we want to get past the disinformation. We want to get to the truth. And that's the truth is what it's all about. Beautifully said, Frankie. Amen to, uh, uh, thank you. Amen to everything. Not Frank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Frank you. Frank you, Frank. Um, it's also about balance. And this is something we're moving into balance, exchange of value. Um, I know I know a lot of people don't see this, but what you see on the screen is a product, a result. It's not it's not the journey, it's the result of a very long and extensive journey of research, introspection, fact checking, and all these things. This is this is real work. We love to do it. But so please support, support it in the way you see fit. Uh, hop over, watch Tale of Two Timelines and all the good stuff. Uh, Frank, thank you so much. We'll have you back very soon. We have lots and lots to talk about. The next conversation, I kind of put it out there. I think we're going to focus on our beautiful organic timeline and everything that's beautifully happening right now on that timeline. So we can elevate that as well. And um, until then, thank you again, Frank. Uh, be blessed on your speaking engagements. And I look forward to our next one. I do too, John. Thanks again. God bless you. Inspired Tribe, thank you so much for tuning in. We love you. We appreciate you. We'll be back with you again very, very soon. And as Frank just said, God bless you all. We're more dedicated than ever to provide authentic, truthful, and uncensored information and inspiration. That's why we created the Inspired Community on the free speech platform, Locals. There is no censorship, a free flow of information, and it's more personal and intimate. And you can join us as a free member or a paid supporter. Please visit inspired.locals.com and join us today.